This is conference will now be recorded. 2021 uh, Planning Commission meeting to order. Uh, we roll call. Uh, Mary Benton. Here. Lloyd Colston. Here. Sorry. Joni Spicer. Paisley Howerton. Here. Charles Jennings. Here. Ian Coon. Here. Cody Richardson. Here. And in case you didn't know, Joni's was married, and so her name was changed. So that's what that was about. <laughs> but she's not able to be here tonight. Okay, uh, read the declaration at this time. The planning commission members are asked to make a declaration of any conflict of interest or any ex parte or outside communication that might influence your ability to hear all sides on any item on the agenda so that you might come to a fair decision. Chilling is a lot of friends, so I can make a decision. Okay, all right. I think that's just fine. Okay. <laughs> That's a that's a platonic relationship in a small community. Excuse me. I said it's a platonic relationship in a small community. We're typically going to see our friends when they come. Okay, I'd like to also uh, give space for uh, public comments. Anyone who wishes to address the planning commission regarding items not on the agenda, I'll ask uh, if there is any comments would be brief. And to clarify, Mr. Bowman is going to be speaking during the comprehensive and plan section. So he's on the agenda, as far as I can say. <laughs> Super, move on to the consent agenda. We have the uh, minutes for October 12th. I trust that you've been given uh, due time to review the minutes as recorded. Get the audible. Uh, Lloyd, are you are you are you audibly with us? It was earlier. Since it's unmuted, unmuted now. There you go. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Motion to uh, approve of the minutes. Motion we approve the minutes from last meeting. We have a motion from Cody Richardson. Minute. And a second from uh, Commissioner uh, Benton for approval of the minutes as written. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you. I forget the delay. Okay. Any opposed? Signify the same way. Thank you. Continue forward. Okay. Uh, now, for first order of business, we will recess our planning commission meeting and convene the Board of Zoning Appeals. And since I'm the chair of the Board of Zoning Appeals, uh, I make a motion that we recess the planning the zoning appeals and Planning Commission. Planning Commission. Okay, the opposite. Recess the Planning Commission. Thank you, Mr. Richardson, and uh, convene the uh, zoning. Thank you, Mr. Colson. Okay. All right. Okay, and on the agenda for the Board of Zoning Appeals to hold a public hearing to consider the advisability of granting a variance to the minimum lot size required. Uh, Required side yard setback for a proposed lot split at 308 South 2nd Street. Staff
Second to open the public hearing. Um, it's you too. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, thanks. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. So what's going on here is uh, Brennan and Sarah Jelling have requested a box flip. Um, the issue is that the lot split will create a lot that is too small for um, the zoning regulations. I don't know if anybody was on the board of zoning appeals at the time we did this several years ago for some other case. That long well, it was for sure. Uh, this is the property in question right here at the at second Washington, and it's going to split off this little piece here. I have another survey that I'll show in a little bit. Um, it shows that a little bit better. Um, but again, it's at 306 and 308. The area surrounding the property is residential and commercial, and the college is off to the northwest. There is a church, the Presbyterian Church is off to the southeast. Um, regulations require a minimum lot to be uh, at least 5,600 square feet. This would uh, result in a lot of 4,700 or so square feet. Um, in addition to that, this is creating a new problem, um, but the buildings are already there. Um, but I figured we, in one swoop, we can take care of this too, and so they won't have any issues um, if they try to sell the property in the future. Um, but this creates a side yard that's about 4.3 feet, um, and the requirement is 10 feet. Again, already pre existing. That's not a matter. We're just clearing up some paperwork this way. The property was developed with the home in 1920, actually, both homes in 1920, according to the county. Um, there was an addition added in 2019 to the main home, but that's to the north, not to the south where this is. Uh, the garage that's on the site, it's I'll just point it out. That's right here was built a little bit later, probably in 1930 or so. Um, there wasn't any other land uses that I could find for those problems. So as far as compatibility with the neighborhood, um, the neighborhood already has some smaller lots. Um, this won't be out of the ordinary for this area. Um, the use is not going to change. It's still going to be residential. It's still going to be a house. So I feel that the granting of the variance would negatively affect the rights of the neighbors. Somebody else just around. And the same thing with the public health. Um, a granting of variance here that the only public health issue, and this is what came up on the other case that I was referencing, was uh, fire related. But again, in this case, the house is already there anyways. Um, so we're not creating a new hazard by allowing this to happen because we're not putting new structures in that weren't already there. The case that I'm referring to, there was going to be um, something built in the future, which probably never happened. <laughs> um, 
As far as the hardship is concerned, um, I feel that there is a hardship on the applicant because there's no way to split off this house um, without doing it this way. I suppose you could do some funny stuff with the, uh, the property line, making a turn and whatnot, but it, it, that would be kind of uh, what, what the proposal was is to sell the one house separately from the other one. And so that's why the lot splits even with five. Um, comprehensive plans, zoning regulations. Uh, like I usually say when this question comes up, it's not that unusual to grant a variance um, for something like this. Basically, we're in a neighborhood, it's an older established neighborhood. It's not that unusual to grant a variance if there's a strange case that, that comes up, sort of like what this is going on here. And again, there's other lots in this general neighborhood that are very similar size. Um, there's maybe a little bit bigger, but I, I think several of them are in the 30s and 40s as far as width is concerned. This one is almost kind of right into that. So, so this is the this is a survey. The excerpt of the survey. Uh, the main house is right here. Now that addition wasn't done when the survey was on, but it's it's up here. Um, there is another property back here, um, but that and that property is going to be unaffected by this. In fact, I even talked to that property owner just because she was asking questions about this property, and once I explained to her what was happening, she wasn't concerned about it. Uh, but this is this is the other house that's currently part of it. Um, there's um, I don't have a measurement for how far this one is from the property line, but it's at least ten feet. And this one, there's a five point two uh, measurement there, but I, I'm not sure what the server was trying to show there because this part here is actually just a little bit closer. Um, the back part is just the porch, uh, so I wasn't using that to count. And I'm not sure how far the house to the south is, but again, that house is already there. The property line's already there. It's probably somewhere in the neighborhood of five to ten feet, based on that neighborhood, based on some of the other pictures. So, I have picture. Okay. This is this is looking. I didn't really talk about the pictures very much, but this is showing the neighborhood is residential. The off to the right in this picture is one of the college's parking lots. So this is that neighborhood that's transitioning from college into just a regular residential neighborhood. Um, and other than the commercial property that's around right the back side there, there's not a whole lot of commercial right immediately here, but it is. There. And of course, you can see ADM is way back in the back there. Uh, it is the recommendation from staff that this variance for a lot split would be uh, granted uh, based on the following considerations. So, again, the strict application of the regulations, which is probably the key one that you need to look at, um, would result in the applicant not being able to separate this house from the other property. Um, I think this house was probably what we used to call a mother-in-law house or something like that um, at one point. So that's probably why it was built so far back from the street. And so opposed to the other house. Um, the granting of the variance shouldn't be opposed to the general spirit of intent of regulations. Again, this is an all variance. It's also my recommendation that um, this side yard setback be granted. In fact, um, not granting this one, but granting the other one doesn't even make sense. <laughs> this is, they've got to go together, so we've had to do both of them at the same time. Um, this structure again is pre-existing. The garage is still going to be at least nine feet away from the house, uh, so that's not going to be a huge issue. The house is at least ten feet, because uh, we're not talking about new construction here. And again, not opposed to the general intent to spirit. Uh, and all the factors were built uh, long before these regulations were in place. So. 
that. I don't think I really have anything else to say. I'll just walk Wendy in that today. Thank you. Uh, questions, comments, concerns from the. Uh... I am. I um, I I've seen that house, and I think that little guest house, normal house, is in pretty bad shape. Right. I think they fixed it up recently. Last year. Just out of curiosity, is my go ahead. Go ahead, sir. My concern was that nine feet separation from the house to the garage. But um, given that, I will move that we grant the variance. Do we have, do um, we have any, other, any other comment? Can, can we I think, I think, uh, I think more discussion is required on this. I move that we table this until the next meeting. I'll second the table. Okay, we, all right, okay. We, we, we actually received a motion uh, to approve uh, that was kind of premature. Uh, and now we have a motion to table. Uh, can you, uh, was that Mr. Coon that offered that motion? The first yes, yes, I, yes, I Mr. did the motion and you didn't get a second. Uh, you do have a motion with a second. <laughs> we did have a second on that motion. Mr. Mr. Colston, would, would you be willing to retract your uh, initial motion? I will retract my initial motion. That is all that. Okay. Now, now, Mr. Coon, would you like to talk to uh, the, uh, the merit of, of tabling this? I'm sorry, Mr. Jennings, could you repeat that, please? Try, try to get a little bit of your rationale of why you think we should uh, table uh, this matter. Uh, we agree with what I'm saying. We've had minimal discussion. Uh, we have staff available here uh, to, well, to uh, answer questions. We have. I think if I think if we're violating current zoning laws, that we should look at the matter. And again, I have some heartburn with the. Uh, less than 10 feet separation of the house to the garage. Yeah, I would like to do my own research. I, I, I think that uh, uh, this is another one of those sticky wickets where uh, we had either incredibly liberal uh, zoning uh, regulations or none uh, when those structures were built. Uh, we have a few neighborhoods like that around the community uh, where what we call our current uh, protocols for zoning and, and distances between structures and property lines. Uh, basically, those properties are out of compliance, but they have been for 50 or more years. So, so I, uh, we're, we're, we're going to, this isn't uncommon. We'll run into more of those. Uh, We'll run into more of those as people acquire older properties and uh, a new construction or remodeling or separation of two real properties. But question at me. this point was when when were those structures built? What year? 1920 is what what I discovered. So these go back 100 years. So yeah, if, we're, right if, if this is a consistent issue, then maybe we should look at the zoning laws themselves. Well, the problem is that this is an old issue. Uh, In other words, this has come up before. 
Well, well, what we're saying again is it's, but this is, this is 100 year old construction when we didn't have those uh, safety protocols in place. So, so where we have those in older neighborhoods in the community uh, with two structures so closely together, we're, we're going to see more of these types of scenarios, not a bunch, but it's when you have 100 year old properties that you're trying to apply 21st century uh, uh, zoning laws and regulations towards. I'm sure there was a purpose for these zoning laws, even if they're 100 years old. A lot of oh, the laws sorry. are. Yeah, can you? 100 years uh, Mr. old. Coon? Mr. Coon? Yes. Can, yes, sir. Can you, flip, can you flip those rather than saying that the zoning, we're not saying the zoning laws are 100 years old. We're saying that these properties were constructed long before we had such okay. uh, codes in place. All right, I understand. I will resend my motion to table and again, uh, make a motion to approve the variance. Yes. Okay, so Mr. Mr. Kuhn entered a motion to uh, table. We had a second on that. And uh, I made. Okay. So, so Mr. Kuhn, if you would rescind your motion to table. Sorry, those those just happen so fast. But we want to we want to chase them away. We want to make sure we're good. Sure. I would Are, like to look into this more, but if the other members of the board are in agreement, then I will rescind my motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Coon. And our second, is our second rescinded also? Uh, yes, I rescinded it and made a motion to approve this okay. variant. All right. Okay, all right. So, so now we, we have a motion to, to approve. Uh, does anybody else have any? We have a second from Commissioner Benton uh, uh, on the matter. Any discussion on the motion? I, I would like to add this language that so we, we understand your concerns, Mr. Kuhn. And, and there might be, as we continue to dive through the uh, comprehensive plan and, and zoning things, there might be a need to, to, to craft some language that would apply to uh, uh, future scenarios. You know, rather than doing them all case by case, because there are a number of these in existence. I, I would definitely agree with that. And, and I understand what Mr. Kuhn is saying for the same reason there are there are ways to deal with old neighborhoods. Uh, we just and don't. my heartburn with this whole thing was the 10 foot separation of the garage to the house. There's no way to fix that. So I'm, I'm in favor of granting the variance. So we do have a motion. We do have a second. I think we don't have any further comment on the matter. Okay, well, then in that in that event, we'll uh, call for a vote on the motion to approve the variance. This is a roll call, roll call vote. So, Mary Minton? Yes. Lloyd Colston? Yes. Charles Jennings? Yes. Ian Coon? Yes. Cody Richardson? Yes. And to clarify, uh, is uh, a, not a member of the board of science. Oh, <laughs> that's why she's on. Okay. Thank you. Motion, motion is uh, it is passed. The approval is granted. Uh, there being no further agenda items for the board of zoning appeals. Uh, we want to uh, 
we need to adjourn the Board of Zoning Appeals sign and die and re reconvene the Planning Commission meeting. So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Hinton. Second. And thank you, Commissioner Richardson. Uh, the Board of Zoning Appeals meeting is adjourned. We are back in our Planning Commission meeting and we have one item on the agenda by staff the comprehensive plan. Mr. White, we will grant you the floor. We are grateful. Can I do this? Can I do this? <laughs> Can I do this? <laughs> you can do what you need to do. No, you go ahead. You go ahead. You go ahead. Uh, first of all, I I thank you for tolerating sometimes a hybrid meeting can be a challenge. Um, but we got we got through that, and sometimes the board is zoning process so we don't do it very often. That being said, um, wanted to move into a discussion of the comprehensive plan. And today we're I put down that we were going to do land use, but I think we're going to kind of go back and forth between a couple of different topics tonight. And the one I wanted to start with was health, and the reason we're doing that is because we were able to to bring on Mr. Jeff Bowman from, from South Central Kansas Health um, and wanted to give him an opportunity to kind of talk about uh, what's going on with SEK Health, and talk about maybe what some of their future plans are and some of their current challenges. That's kind of what we're, kind of what we're looking for from him. So. Current challenges based on land or on CMS mandate? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So our uh, our biggest challenge right now is that we have 47 percent of our employees that are not vaccinated. Um, while I'm not an anti-vaxxer at all, um, I look at it from the standpoint that we all have freedoms. The 53 percent that chose to be vaccinated, um, that's wonderful. I also feel like the 47% that doesn't want to be vaccinated should have that advantage, and they don't. See, we are a PPS hospital, um, so we receive, in all hospitals, receive Medicare and Medicaid, and it's usually about 50% of your business. So it's an impossible feat for us to give up that type of business because we would close the doors. It's also an impossible feat to learn those 47% of your staff. Um, there was a CEO in Western Kansas. Um, I'm on a committee with him, and when the CMS mandate came in place for um, healthcare facilities, it started with the nursing homes, and he lost 50% of his staff, and therefore you lose 50% of your staff, plus 50% of your patients. So I feel like at this point in time, our government's a little short-sighted in a conservative state like Kansas is, where we want to have freedoms, we want to make decisions. Um, it's going to tie us down to where we, if we lose 47%, we possibly will only be able to treat half the patients that we typically treat or treat. So that's our biggest concern um, right now. As far as our plan for the future, um, we are starting the CK Health Foundation. We've named the director as Pam Crane. Uh, we will be having our first uh, Board of Directors or Board of Trustees meeting for the foundation this week. Um, and we're looking at uh, the long-term plans. If you look from the standpoint that we have 90 acres around the facility, um, we have opportunities to grow. Uh, looking at potentially doing a capital fundraiser of about $3 million for our first year is our goal. And that would allow us to be able to do some a medical office building, a daycare, different things like that. Right now we have four clinics. We're paying over $25,000 a month in rent. Um, so if there's an opportunity for us to be able to do, I'm sorry, I'm having a call too, so I gotta make sure, not the hospital. Um, so we know that Cali County as a whole has identified daycare, as an issue, it would also be a benefit for healthcare workers to have a daycare. So there's grant money available for any facility that's opened that uh, has at least two shifts. So we're looking at that as an op opportunity. Also, we can write off some of the money on the back side against our cost report for a cost of the, the facility. 
So I think many of you might know that we crossed the Mason Dixon railroad tracks at Stratford Field and went to Winfield Medical Arts a few years ago. And that's been a sore subject. Um, we were finally able to get that uh, clinic profitable in 2019. Uh, but the lease is up in um, October of 2022. The building went into foreclosure, was auctioned off last March, and the bank bought it back. The bank. Um, they're allowing us to continue with the lease, but I don't know the long term future of that. So, looking at the opportunities of being able to build on our 90 acres would be a huge benefit for us. Um, so, that's one of our goals. We're also looking at uh, a 50% expansion of our geriatric behavior health unit. Um, the way the state has worked, they have a new program called SIA. We know behavior health is a growing issue nationwide and as well as in Kansas, but the beds are not available. So we have 11 beds available and we're full 95% of the time. So, and we just found out last week that Beloit closed and they have 10 beds. So, we have an opportunity to grow in 2022. We're looking at all will be through brick and mortar grants. Um, and we're not looking at any of it from a standpoint of looking for taxes, anything like that. We want to be able to be self-sufficient and grow everything um, based on our productivity and being able to grow right now where we are. I think we're on track this year, we're still um, year to date, uh, profitable seven hundred thirty-five thousand, and we've been being profitable for the last few years, and we have this opportunity with the foundation to really take us to the next level. And so that's my plan and, and our plan. I don't know if many of y'all saw the original development and, and plan for the ninety acres. Um, whoever made that up was very ambitious. They thought they were in Newton. Because um, it looks like the new campus, if you will. Um, we don't have the benefit of having a great working relationship with Winfield yet. Um, we did have meetings and we're working to see what we can do um, to collaborate together and see if there's any opportunities and synergies here. But I do feel like having the opportunity to develop that area out there will be huge for not just our city, but Winfield and Cali County as a well. whole. And so that's our plan. Um, Sutherland Foundation is a group that specializes in healthcare grants. They gave a grant last year for $25 million to a children's hospital in Kansas City for expansion. So we've been interviewing grant writers and we've selected one and we'll start that process. Hope to break ground, at least on the behavior health unit expansion and hopefully a daycare in 2022. I think that's all I have. Did I answer all the, the list? <laughs> that sounds like a vision that uh, that starts with the babies and ends with the seniors. There we go. And the things in between. Absolutely. And it's, it is an exciting opportunity, guys. I mean, Rarely do you have that much undeveloped land in, in a rural hospital. I know a lot of people have had concerns about opening the hospital out there, but I think as healthcare grows, we're in the perfect place. When you say you don't have a good relationship with Winfield, you mean hospital? Yeah, I wouldn't say we don't have a uh, we don't have a relationship. I would say that we have a backing. We just don't truly have a relationship. I'm used to being in a town where, you know, Methodist Hospital on this corner, the city hospital is here, and the HCA hospital is here, and they all work together. Providers have privileges at all the hospitals. And we have done that. A lot of the providers that within the first three months of me being here, we got paid privileges to the um, podiatrist, to one of the OBs, Dr. Um, Black of his name, Daniels, his first name. The only doctor in the field. I can think of something. I'll get you in the morning. I'll be there. There you go. Then it'll come to us. But it's an opportunity. I mean, there's so much synergy. Um, they have some problems with their lab. And so they've been sending labs to us. We're trying to figure out a way. I mean, we're seven miles apart, basically. So when I spend for ultrasounds on the weekend, 
it might be an opportunity where they can send them down that weekend and then they step. So we're looking at ways to share the resources because it's too cost prohibitive right now with the way we're having to staff the travel. So for example, I'm in a respiratory virus and I can't get a high industry there because they've gone to travel. They make hundreds of dollars an hour. I have half a million, 150 an hour for a travel agency, um, nurse, RT, respiratory therapist, whatever. So if we have that opportunity to share workers with Winfield and can figure out that model how this works, we all win. Um, so that, that's our goal. So you think it might just be a matter of taking some steps to try to build bridges with relationships with I've been doing that for three years. Okay. And it's been a little difficult. Well, it, it was. Um, my last request was basically that, you know, we're almost two years into COVID. It's changed the outlook of healthcare nationwide forever. So, can we figure out a way to work together? Meeting with Mr. Clinton and some of his key administration, and we're having another meeting in January. So we're looking at ways to actively do this. So. I think it's important to know when we had our health discussion, one of the topics that kept coming up was collaborating. So I think that's a continuing theme we're seeing is getting all of our healthcare providers to find a way to bounce off each other and share resources. So I'm encouraged by that. But you're doing that too. I'm telling you, it's beautiful. Um, I will laugh. There, there, we've had our own set of struggles. Um, right now, I'm happy to repair and do some clean up on the air conditioning units that were not installed properly to begin with. Um, so that's going to cost us a good chunk of money. Um, I don't know if you guys know, but the build the specialty clinic building right to 6403, right east of the hospital, um, that's connected by the breezeway, all the windows in that were put in backwards. So when I found that out, we had to hire in um, all I had to pay for was the steaming and stuff around them. They gave us the the crew for free. Um, but it's a little frustrating. I mean, you guys spent $23 million on the hospital. Is that correct? 28. 28. So when I got a bid that I need to replace all the air conditioning units because they were not done properly, um, for $1.5 million, I had a heart attack first. And then I called and I said, how do you fix it without that? It came in right around 200000 uh, it's just simple things, you guys. I think you guys know the history of the sewer caps not being put on the walls and the surgery suites sinking for a year before somebody figured that out. We're still finding things that weren't done properly up front, unfortunately. But I think we're in a better place than we were. Well, well, the signature line of the movie was, if you build it, they will come. That's what they said. It did not, they did not say, if you build it well, or if you build it correctly, <laughs> they will come. That's not what I was expecting you to say. So, I appreciate that clarification. You just have to kind of get to that, you know, I, I mean, and, and in your, even in your remarks, one of the things, being an, an old head in the county, I, I would say that, that you should perhaps celebrate that you can clear, you have to characterize the rapport between the two principal cities and healthcare is right now kind of a no relationship because that means that somehow someone has done some good with kind of shattering what was a poor foundation for relationship. Uh, uh, they, COVID has done a good job of forcing yeah. rural health care to, to recognize a common agenda and objective. And, and, and it isn't to, it isn't to one to swallow the other up. Right. And so dialogue had been some sort of 
unbridled zeal in the past. Uh, but but so so no relationship lays the groundwork for the right relationship to develop as opposed to uh, as opposed to uh, trying to build on top of what really was kind of a, a basis of competing agendas. I'm not sure it's coming out for the right so, so I think you call that progress. I did. You you have you have you have you have you have now the, the opportunity to, to build and, and you have the impetus, which is COVID, which people thought was a six month thing. And now we're going to year two and we're still struggling trying to hit the other 53% and realize it's real. Uh, sorry, 47, 47. Okay. <laughs> I think that's the hardest part though. You, you worked out there with us for a while. It's, it's the, the changing information. It, it's, it's confusing for us that work in healthcare. So, how do we expect everybody else to understand? Um, and the, originally, the CDC said that if you had COVID, that you shouldn't get a vaccination for 90 days. Now that's removed from the website. And they say, yeah, I can get it. Um, I, for example, I have COVID. I still have an IgG of 1.2, which you would hope you would get with the vaccine. Um, but apparently that doesn't matter. And they say that I, and I'm questioning this without being in a position, but how is it possible that a man made vaccinations better than the natural immunity that you got from the infection? And that's what they're saying now. So we keep moving the, the bar and changing the story. And, it just gets so complicated after a while. And, uh, and this is this is actually harmonious with the other piece. We heard a lot earlier in August uh, of uh, the discussion was kind of anchored around mental health and and uh, uh, some dialogue about how uh, this twelve months, sixteen months of COVID environment and. Uh, information misinformation disinformation yep. was wearing on the minds uh, of communities of individuals of healthcare workers etc so uh, uh so we appreciate hearing the perspective that that you that you shared on tonight the positives yeah. and the opportunities and uh, I, I i would i would suppose that if we were able to loudspeaker this around there would be a great hurrah uh at you using the language of grants you know, to do things futuristic as opposed to uh, as opposed to uh, the traditional way. Absolutely, <laughs> we don't want to do the traditional. Way. We're going to be untraditional from here on. So, great place for babies, great place for older people, and that really kind of fits our 2020 census profile. You know, we got a lot of new birth happening, but we're an aging community. Yeah. So, Great vision. Great vision. Anybody else comments? It sounds like you got a great plan, a common sense, logical, staying off the uh, taxpayers' backs. Sounds great. Good. Yeah, thank you. I guess that's all for healthcare. <laughs> Andrew, did you say you wanted to talk about? Uh, Parks and that kind of stuff? Yeah, just for a few minutes. Move up the rest of this if you speak. Does that mean I leave? Thank you guys. Did it to the law. Yes, thanks for coming. Thank you guys. I appreciate you inviting me. Good to see y'all. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Okay. I'm not going to go through this entire 137 page document. You can read it for yourself if you really want to. It's on the City of Winfield website. Yes, we know this is Winfield, but it's a good plan. <laughs> I will steal from anyone and everyone I can to make our work better. <laughs> I mean that in the nicest way possible. Um, so, if you're not aware, Winfield did a master plan for parks and trails over the last couple of years. COVID hit about halfway through, so they kind of faded to the finish line in the virtual meeting setting. Um, but they're a little bit ahead of us in that they're just done and published, whereas we are in the very early stages, really, of the multimodal transportation master plan. 
<clears throat> but what I really want to talk about is the park side, because this plan, if you go through it, is about 90% parks and maybe 10% trails. Um, and I think there's some things in here that kind of match what Josh and I were already thinking of doing and what we kind of talked to the education board about. But I just wanted to touch base with you guys and make sure we're on the right track before we go any further down this road. Um, obviously, they had a consultant come in and prepare this form. It was paid for by Rice County. I think it was you know, partially by Rice County, partially by the city, and I think the Chamber of Commerce gave them some funds. I want to say it was in the range of about $50,000. So they certainly got their money's worth in terms of paperweight. Uh, but there's some good stuff in here, and I, like I said, I'm not going to go through everything, but it's it's quite a, you know, we'll have an overview. We have the parts map, you've seen it, an existing plan. It may not, you know, quite change a little bit like this, but we'll still have a lot of stuff. They've got their summary of all the locations and acreage and all that, just like we've had in the past plan. But the parts that kind of interested me more were ways down. Uh, they got a lot of photos, so you know there's nothing wrong with that. But they started looking at other communities in this plan, which we I don't think we'll include in our comprehensive plan. But this is a good document, I think, as an internal resource for staff, for you guys, and, and some of the other boards. Uh, what are other cities doing? This is a big time save for me because I was already planning to you know, make some phone calls and stuff, and now I kind of know I'm looking for it. So they looked at Wichita and Andover and further down, way down at the bottom. They've looked at Wellington, Alvarado, Augusta, and a bunch of other, and they looked at us. So our parks are actually in their plan, <laughs> which I found kind of, including Brock Park, which is the longer park. It must not have got the on that. But um, it was kind of interesting. <laughs> um, here's where they talk about their methodology and the questionnaire. That is one thing I definitely want to talk to you guys about tonight um, and some of the accumulation. So they assess the park visitation. I think that is something we need to do. And we've talked about that a lot in the last few years. You know, how busy are our parks? Eyeball-wise, we can kind of tell you definitely Harris Park, Wilson Park, and some of the neighborhood parks. Um, that's been a contentious issue ever since the whole Catawba Park thing was going. Um, but we've never really self-reported that with citizen surveys, so I think we are going to try to tackle that a little bit. I'm not quite sure, and I want to ask every single part of the survey. I think we're going to maybe be a little more creative, but we'll work with our consultant on it. And then they ask their public to rate the facilities. I think we can probably do something like that, but I'm not as interested in quantitative data when it comes out as I am qualitative. Because I don't know, you guys, when you sit and you look at a survey, you're like, oh, right from one to ten, I mean, I have to tell them just a darn number. Does it really accurately? To me, I want to know is it, what is it missing? What do you want to see? So, to that end, Harrison was a big help, and some of our other board members um, at Arcalala, we just sat outside the chamber and we collected some survey responses just to fill in the blank. What are the three things you want to see? And I have not finished going through all those yet, unfortunately. I was hoping to have something for you tonight, but I will by December. But I'll tell you, and make this free when we do, but just flip them through. And I saw a lot about in the streets and trails, not just parks. But I saw a lot about, um, you know, there's some Wilson Park stuff. There was stuff about the pool. But, you know, it's, I want to find the commonalities because to me, I mean, I think we had about 100 responses, but it, it's only people that we randomly caught that day and are all walking by. Obviously, we'll do some more surveying and try to be a little more comprehensive, but. For me, it's about okay, which which things pop out the most. So I'm going to make like a word cloud map so you can kind of see that visually, and then that's what I want to use to kind of drill down into like what our actual survey question is going to be. So I don't know if I want to do this kind of technical. This this plan honestly is a little bit overkill, I think, for some of what we need. But it's it's one way to look at it. And then there's a whole bunch of info in here about sustainability and how do you maintain parks. Lots of stuff we don't have to get into right now, but um, accessibility. But this is all kind of stuff we can borrow from through our plan and just make sure we reference it in our own language. I'm not going to say we'll straight up plagiarize them, but I think we can adapt some of what's already been presented. Have a seat back there. Never plagiarize. Uh, you know, we control through. I mean, this is getting into some nitty gritty stuff. It isn't really you guys. Some of that's the education board, some of that's working with staff. But if you really are passionate about this, get all of me and I can accommodate you. Uh, but looking at parking and stuff, you know, that's starting to get a little bit more in the transportation and land use. Um, this. And then, of course, you know, all the fun stores things. So, you know, there's splash pads. This thing talks a lot about splash pads. I think it's probably why Winfield went ahead and did a couple of them. Um, we are going to reach out to communities that have them as identified this plan and get some more input on that specific issue as we talk more about Wilson Park. But I don't want to get that too much with the survey right now. And we don't care about their lake, we don't have a lake. So this is kind of more what I'm looking at. So they kind of went through each facility and they put together 
a plan that's more site specific. So they've got a picture, they've got in here, you know, okay, here's where you could do a splash pad, here's where you could put parking, here's where you could do expansion, and then they got the goals. So what we talked about was measurable SMART goals, right? I think how they presented it was kind of what we were wanting to do. We would like to have a plan for each area that kind of schedules it out. The one thing they don't have is an attached date. So we talked about having timelines. They don't really have that, but what they do have is you go through this a little further down, and they got a bunch of parks too. Um, I don't know that we need this level of detail in every single park we do, but you know, here they're looking at a farm and mark a pavilion, kind of like what we are getting ready to break ground hopefully next week. Um, so the, we we have the same needs as a community. So I think I want to you know kind of learn from what they've already done here and not just start from scratch. Where is that table? Sorry, this is a very very detailed document. Okay. Uh, one thing, this is transportation, not parks, but they did an assessment of sidewalks in 2010. They estimated, um, MKC came in, that they have 67 miles of paved sidewalk, and they did a calculation if they replaced so much this year. They're trying to do $100,000 a year for sidewalk repair. I mean, guys, right now, we couldn't even touch that in the budget without, like, serious grant help. And even at that rate, they're talking 70 years to do a full replacement of everything. So just to give you an idea, now we're working on sidewalk assessment with the Equal Opportunity Board, it's going slow. So it's probably gonna be possibly spring before we really get that detailed assessment we want. But I can tell you it's gonna be every bit of that, if not more like 80, 90 years at the rate we're moving. So that's something we need to kind of figure out a better plan for, but every community's dealing with it. Um, these are questions I definitely like to ask, the usage of sidewalks. We kind of already have started that a little bit at the high school. They actually surveyed the kids there, and, and we already got surprising results out of it. So we were expecting 8th Street to be a problem area. Almost universally, it's Radio Lane. So we are already looking at a project. Um, they're working on a sidewalk project, but we're looking at what we can we do on Radio Lane with the existing roadway and maybe incorporate it into next year's construction work. Um, Rice Cowley's got some money, so it's moving quick, but it's all because the students told us this is the way we're walking. We wouldn't have known that if we hadn't asked, so we've got to do the surveying. Um, and there's some questions about, you know, how do we budget for us? I think we have to get at this. I'm just not quite ready to go into the sidewalk issue because that's that's a hot button topic. I mean, the way the law is written, it's the property owner that's supposed to fix it. Uh, but realistically, it's, obviously that approach has not been working. So as a community, I think we need to look at how can the city get some skin in the game. But we've talked about some things like, uh, Winfield's gotten an attachment for their cement mixer where they can just lay it down, boom, and they don't do the forms and everything. And I think that's something we are going to look into. What would that cost? What would the maintenance be? Because a lot of this stuff, if we could get it prepped, so many screws will come in with a cement mixer and knock it out in a day or two. And we may even try that on the sidewalk project just to see how it goes. Not everything has to be bid out as a big full-blown construction project. There's some stuff we can do in-house. And even if we just budgeted for, you know, two blocks a year, at least that's more than what we're doing now, which is practically nothing. So I think we'll kind of look at some of that a little bit later. Okay, so here's their park. Um, this is a trail expansion map. So I've already talked to Josh about kind of recolorizing ours to match this, but we haven't, of course, finalized it because we're working on that plan separately with the Traffic Safety Committee. So here's where I'm talking about. Priority, short term within five years, midterm five to 10 years, long term 10 to 20 years. I think that's kind of what we talked about. I think we were talking about 20 years. So if we can identify those as not going to get done this decade, because there's some things we already know pretty done right. Uh, but we could put it on there so that 2030, when that planning commission is updating the plan, that they know, okay, move this up into the next bucket or kick it aside and look at something different. So they kind of did that. It's just not, this is how they did it ongoing goal short-term, mid-term, long-term. So they have all confidence in the plan and follows that same thing. Too. Right. So terminology might be a little different for us, but this is the gist of it. As I was going through this, I saw things I didn't even think about. So I'm again, if you want to get into granular detail, get with me, but really the beautification board will kind of dig into this a little more. <clears throat> so, you know, it's talking about not just like maintenance, but you know, programs, expansions, how to get other community agencies involved in in usage, um, acquisition. You know, they're already here. They were talking about the Southwest bypass. That's actually 
potentially going to get on the Ike pipeline here in the next round. They had a really good presentation recently on it. Um, you know, vacating around the aquatic center. Well, that's what we talked about with Paris Park and Fifth Avenue. So we could we could put it on there as a placeholder because it doesn't seem like it's imminent right now. We know that there's another committee working on that whole thing, but we need to reflect it in here. Um, green infrastructure. I thought this was interesting. Talking about you know permeable pavement. So we've talked about stormwater, but actually putting in a goal to have more surface that isn't going to create the runoff as one area of kind of helping stormwater. There's just some interesting things in here that we're going to look at. Um, and then it gets into, you know, more of the, what to do with grass and weeds and that sort of thing. Trees, that's a whole other issue. But you see how they broke this out, park by park by park. That's what we want to do. So hearing all this, do you think we're on the right track or do I need to hear some comments and kind of change course on that? Because if not, I'm going to give it the beautification board in December and we're going to start probably staff to kind of come up with a draft plan and then they're going to start moving things around and changing it from short to mid to long, that kind of thing. And then we'll bring it back to you guys, maybe January, I don't know. It just depends on how long we have. We got a lot of parks, so. But they've been to every park. They finished the last visit this month or just last month with Wilson Park. Uh, so they've been, it's all fresh in their minds at this point. It's just kind of sitting there and saying, okay, when do we want to look at bathrooms here? When do we want to do trails here and that kind of thing. I got a comment there. Yes. Um, I was there two days with the surveys, I, and I, it gave me a, a real chance to talk with people. And lots, a lot of people didn't want to do surveys, but they just wanted to talk. Um, and I read all the surveys. Um, at, at the last beautification meeting, there's problems, um, and there's been problems. We are not Winfield, okay? Um, the problem is. I've only lived in our city about two years, but there have been promises made in the past about this, 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 and this, and then there's even been timelines. So the citizens in this community are expecting things. They're expecting this and this and this to happen. And the people on the board, the ADA boards, you know, these people are, they have their purpose and they have their, their cause. And, things that they stand for and the people on the beautification board they have things that they want the problem is they're not getting the information they need they don't realize how little money the city has they don't realize these grants are matching grants or that a splash pad is going to cost about a million dollars not seven hundred fifty thousand and three hundred thousand dollar grant ain't going to take us there Maintenance on those things is about 150,000 a year, um, and they're usable for just maybe three months out of the year. Um, there's so many things that are factoring in on this. The people that are on these boards are are um, have families, they have jobs, they don't have the free time I do to go to all these meetings and hear about the budget concerns and talking about. How are we going to pay for this and that? Like Mike Crandall says, we're replacing our water lines three feet at a time. Um, if people knew the color coding on these fire hydrants, they would be down at City Hall tomorrow with pitchforks. Yes, they would. They, they knew what the colors meant. Um, people in this town have been given promises, and there's no way. There is no way possible it's gonna happen and they're getting angry they're getting frustrated if if i'm the one they're getting mad at me because i'm the one telling them reality because i have the time to go to these meetings i see the city arguing about twenty thousand dollars and we're talking about millions um unless exanoa works the miracle for us um we, we, the budget is the biggest concern we have. Winfield, plain and simple, has a lot more money. We've got people on these boards that are uninformed, and it's not their fault. They they don't have the time to do the research. I went and I talked to Coon Mechanical because they put in a splash pad, and they had to go back and fix it, um, and the maintenance costs all associated with it. So I've done some of this research. 
mom and dad and you know they're working all day they're making dinner for their kids they they don't have the time that you guys have to to do the research and it's really raising habit at the, at the meetings i don't disagree with anything you're saying and i want to read ready you guys are the planning commission so the boards can say whatever they want they can pass some recommendations ultimately you guys are the ones that are setting the goals in this plan and you're passing it on to the city commission so if something comes up to you that you think is unrealistic or you want more information on hit the brakes we will go through that process that's what that's why comprehensive plans take so long um, but here again andrew we've got people you've got a job right you guys have job maybe families yeah, yeah. we got it we got it every board has to be educated so problems get nipped in the butt um, before they get brought to the planning commission we need to be aware of the budget constraints Absolutely. and the mechanical and the, all of these concerns and the tangible effect that might be once we get all the information you guys might say every single thing that the citizens ask for is long term and not going to happen and that's totally acceptable but we have to reflect that citizens are making requests. I mean, ultimately, if everyone is coming to us and asking for something, it's our job as city staff to figure out a way to see if it's possible to make it happen, not to tell them no. Well, that's how that's, that's that's been in the past. They were given promises by the old administration. I agree. And it's a dream. These are goals. These are plans. They're not promises. They're never promises, as you well know. And and functionally, functionally, what what uh, what we're actually, I think, the more gravity for the planning commission is the is is attending to infrastructure things first, aesthetic things, and and and, and the, the sexy things secondarily. You know, because we and if you guys want, you know, like we go through this whole process, you guys want to put a plan that says every single park minimum maintenance only and don't add anything. We'll pass it on to the commission. Absolutely, because this is not our plan. But we have to talk about it. They're here, they exist, and we need to decide. And if you want to recommend closure of parks, it's been a goal as in the last plan. We closed one park since you guys gave us that goal eight years ago. We had a hearing and talked about three other ones, and we are no further along. At some point, we are going to have a realistic conversation about how many parks can this community actually sustain. Let me show you something here real quick that proves my point. So they, like I said, they looked at the other communities and what they had. We have 17 picnic shelters. Oh, that's Winfield, hang on. Or, yeah, 11. Let me just scroll. We have 12 baseball softball diamonds. That's more than any other comparable communities. Uh, let's see, 10 playgrounds. Um, only El Dorado and McPherson has many or more. 11 picnic shelters that's on the high end but the total number of parks they don't have in here but it's it, depending on how you count it but with the recreational areas of New York Pond we're at uh, most communities of our size have maybe half that many and usually what they'll have is several bigger ones we have a lot of these little neighborhood pocket parks we have to mow all that <laughs> I mean you would not believe I can get the number if you want but how much Tony's budget is just the mowing the planting and watering and all the Kind of things that have to happen. That's not playground equipment. That's just daily maintenance. So, so we we we're going chapter by chapter through this topic, by area by area. But uh, if you if your memories banks uh, have, I think, measure accuracy. I think part of what we heard when the recreation folks came through was talking about being more thematic. And being more the logistics, the logistics of place. We are going to look at that. So, so I mean, uh, yeah. so that things like that, where we talk about having this year because we had, you know, we that was that was a city where we did lots of things for neighborhoods because that's the way people live is in the neighborhoods. And now we've become more transversal, and uh, we 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 don't need all the little pockets. We just need to figure out how to get how to optimize what we do get. Yeah. So, on um, so some of that point, I mean, we need to update this. So we do have now an 18-hole disc golf course and a nine-hole disc golf course. Those didn't exist when they compiled this data. But look at the recommendations for Winfield, because it's really not different from what we hear on a daily basis. More playgrounds, particularly ADA accessible. We know ADA accessibility for playgrounds is a nightmare. 
we've got a lot of playgrounds. You just can't roll up on the wheelchair and do anything. So that's what we go with. Um, horseshoe pits, I don't know. We moved them up to Pershing Park. They're not very well used. I think we're right where we need to be there. Splash pad, we can agree or disagree, but that was this consultant's recommendation based on what other communities had um, and expanding their aquatic center, which is something we're talking about with our pool. But then all comparable cities need to be considering options for more looped walking paths. We know that we're working on it. A network of bike paths, same. I'm doing two grants tonight <laughs> toward that end. Pickleball courts, I'll defer to you. Uh, but multi-use courts is something we've talked about, having more of those multi-sport surfaces that you can do a lot more things with, so you're more efficient with your space. Soccer fields, I think we got plenty at the Dow. I'll defer to the rec center. Outdoor fitness plazas is not really a thing we have, but that's something you're seeing more and more in, in other communities. So it's also about trying to kind of like figure out what things are people going to be looking for in the next 15, 20 years that we don't have in place now and are the table. Dog parks being a big one. We keep hearing dog parks. Um, I didn't see it on a lot of the comment forms, but more and more communities are doing that. And but they're expensive to put in the specific kind of infrastructure. But if that's what you know, if that's what people want, that's what can get people here. It's something we should look at. Maybe it doesn't happen for 10, 15, 20 years. But the reason I need, this is me, the staff grant writer, I need it ranked and I need goals because there are grants out there. And when we see the opportunity, we go for it. We're going to go in order of priorities. So we're going to focus on, and right now I'm working off a priority list that is mostly developed by staff, not by the citizens. Uh, the projects that we're applying for grants for have never really but they're not in the conference plan. A central trail certainly isn't. That's something we've come up with internally because we see that it would create those looped paths and the connections that we need, and we know the grant money is available to do it. Um, but we got to get we got to get back in touch with our citizens, and we got to figure out a way to get a good input. So the thing we did was a good start. It's not comprehensive. I know that doing flash flow surveys is not going to get everyone. I think we're going to have to have some public meetings. Um, but I would like to go into those public meetings with at least a framework of an idea of this that's been through you guys a little bit. Not well, the thing I've learned is you just don't just open the doors and have no agenda because it would be completely unproductive. We've got to kind of focus feedback. So that's what we're trying to do with this part by part kind of a framework. And, and, and then we'll adjust based on what the public input is at those meetings. And the commission is going to have a say in this too. But, I just kind of want you guys to understand the process. It's not going to get done in the next two months, to be totally honest. So I think you guys are all starting to realize the conference plan is not going to be wrapped up by January. Um, and well, I need longer, like July. <laughs> well, I, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> we are desperately near that we can get the transportation plan done by March. Um, trans systems is not moving as fast as I would like, but we're going to stay on. Um, the park stuff, I think, you know, winter is the time to sit in closed door meetings and, and hammer that. I think we can get that done in two or three meetings. So I'm hoping by early spring we can kind of have all that to you, but then you guys have to do your process and all that. So um, obviously we're going to have some new faces on this board probably in the next few months. So we'll have to get some people up to speed. It's it's just going to take a little longer than we hoped, but I just kind of wanted to touch base with you guys on it. Originally I was planning to be done with it for this year. Ten. We were gonna do it in twenty twenty, but COVID just... Well we were hoping to be done by the end of the year for the new commission to have a guidance document. That's not gonna happen. It just takes the time. The problem is Andrew is information. Um we we on these committees really depend on uh staff to do all the work for us and then we look at it and we say yes or no because people they don't have the ability to do anything more than that, the people on these committees. Mm -hmm. So these matching grants or these partial grants, we just can't do that anymore. We don't have the ability to fill in the rest of the money. Taxes are already going up this next year. Water bills are going to be going up 40 some percent. Um, we we, we've got to be careful that all the information is given to all the committees so that we catch this right away before it comes to the planning commission. We, we, need, to, we need to make a decision at the root level about do we have the money to do it. 
it well, all think, boils down to money. I think one thing we're going to do in December is I'm going to bring you guys the actual parks budget out of the general fund so you can see where the money's actually going, where it's going to go in 22, and we'll winnow down that wheel to the wedge that we're actually talking about so you guys will have a more realistic understanding. With streets, there's no option. We're going to have to do street maintenance. We've got to figure out a way to prioritize. Um, I hope the infrastructure bill is going to generate some money for us, but it's not going to be a magic solution. It's going to take a lot of things. We are still talking internally about to really make a dent in streets and do what people are wanting to see. That a sales tax is probably about the only realistic way. Uh, we learned something recently. But now we're hearing the states talking about getting rid of the groceries. Sales tax at the local level, or just at the state level, which would be devastating our sales tax collections currently, including what's paying on the hospital. So that's something we're going to follow very closely. Um, as far as the communication goes, I, I just think of an example when uh, when Chad Beeson, everybody probably has their thoughts, and he was he was posting like daily, mm -hmm. our city asked an answer or whatever. For me personally. You know, you drive by a pothole every day and think, man, what are these guys doing? And then all of a sudden he's posting every day and it's like, wow, these guys are getting some stuff done. I see why they didn't do that because they had that leak and that thing and they have, so all of a sudden they're doing the same thing they're always doing. But I'm thinking, oh, these guys are kicking some butt now. Or People don't have the time, but they don't take the time. Yeah. They've got kids, they're driving kids to soccer or baseball or whatever. They're, the people on my community are getting mad at me because I'm the one yeah. telling them the facts. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's not me, it's the we don't have the money. Yeah. And I, I can't get mad at the people on these on these commissions because they're they're trying to serve their community and their family and do a good job with their work. Yeah, I mean my point is you know you go to a, a neighborhood park and close it, everybody close by is gonna be mad about it. But if they knew the story, just like you come in and every day you're saying, here's what we're working on. Oh, we had this much money. Here's what we did. So a few people starting to be happy. But they say, well, all right, that makes sense. So why don't we spread that info to more people, kind of like the Facebook thing did for the well, street. What I've been tasked with doing is keeping street talk going forward. So Chad's not with us anymore, but we're working as staff to try to right. continue to encourage the guys to keep doing that because that has done wonders, I think, for I love for the people who are checking it. It's done wonders for them to understand what the guys are doing on a daily basis, where the money's going. I mean, we're down to five street maintenance workers right now. Yeah. They, they <laughs> so staffing isn't just the hospital challenge. It's, it's a challenge for us as well. So, so I want to winnow us back just a little bit because because what we what we kind of the, this planning commission committed to uh, last year in in our kind of uh, setting a compass point was was that we weren't just going we're not going to promise all of this is done. Uh, we talked for almost the entirety of a meeting on the whole notion of establishing metrics so that not only do we say these are opportunities for improvement, these are needs for, for renovation, but well, we talked about metrics where we can say so that part of this comprehensive plan has to have a measurable value to it. Again, so you talked about you know, immediate, three years, five years, you know, all that so that we can, when we're looking at it and we start to see a little bit of is to say we thought we'd be here in five years okay are we there no what changed i mean you, you really can't justify anything around the last 20 months of pandemic but but functionally what we did see i think you've done a good job pointing that out was things that were written in 2003 uh that were given that we're going to do this and we were in 2018 and there was just wasn't even a speed bump that says we went right past that, never looked back at it. So I think this process is to get metrics to things, something measurable that says okay, it's not done, but we said we think we can be this far down the road, you know, in this, and everything is always anchored around money. Money was no object, but it is. So. And it's hard to understand how strapped the city is unless you go to the meetings and you actually see the discussion going on. Which I'm able to do, but not many people are able to do that. So somehow we have to have access to that at these different commissions. 
Yeah. Well, I can bring you guys a copy of the budget, but it's pretty yeah, simple. Yeah, I had to sum it up, not just for us, but for. We everybody. are working on a budget at a glance. Tammy um, actually prepared budget at a glance because I had a copy with her. She but honestly, it. it'll only be too. You need something in between, I think, for what we're talking about. One of the things I really want to do on the survey is, and I totally agree with you, we just put out a list of what would you like to see? We're going to get a wish list a million dollars times 10 long. There is a way that the survey can do uh, an allocation. So you're given like a hundred dollar budget or whatever. How would you split it up over these things? Because that gives you a better sense of when you got a limitation on your resources, what's truly the most important in the community. I want to do some of those kinds of questions because I think that'll help us a little better figure out what are our core parks where we really need to focus that investment. And then it, I think it would also help you with that short, medium, long term where it should really fall in the priority order. Because if, if you guys don't have an objection, I like the five, 10, 20 years because our CIP is structured the same way. When we do the CIP, we have the next five years of projects. We go through them with the committee, and that gets really in depth. And we talk about O and M operations and maintenance and, and costs beyond the initial, and they weigh all that along with it with their score. But they only do the five years. Um, we show them what the five to ten looks like, and it's penciled in. But a lot of times, that's just you know two hundred thousand water lines every year. It's, there's no real detail in that, and then there's nothing beyond ten years. What's the point of even budgeting that far out? But in the strategic plan, you can kind of always have your 10, 20, 30 year uh, grand vision. But that's the stuff that every 10 years you should be looking at is this even realistic. And, and honestly, a lot of the Wilson Park Master Plan probably falls in that category. Uh, but we've got to we gotta really drill down that zero to five. That's what we need as staff for budgeting, for capital improvement projects, for uh, capital outlay. I mean, it dictates what kind of equipment you're going to buy, how much you're going to have to maintain. You don't need as many mowers if you don't as much to mow. I mean, there's a lot of those. And that's what the commission then deals with day to day. They're the ones who have to figure out what the constraints of the budget um, and set what they can actually generate taxes, how to make all these needs happen. But they're looking at those documents from you guys and the input that was gathered as kind of their guidance in the back of their minds on things. So that when opportunities do come up or when you know, we have a little more resource than we thought, that's where we go back to. So we gotta, we gotta have something to pull together. I think we all kind of agree on what we wanna see. I'm just trying to get us a little more concrete on it. So I think the next step is we'll kind of draft something up. Like I said, we'll have some discussion and bring it to you. But it, when you see it, don't get freaked out because it's not what we're putting in front of the commission. Um, I think it's gonna have to go through a few drafts to get to where we wanna be. And then of course incorporate the public um, but beyond that, that's, I mean, that's kind of where we're at right now. So. Our, our task is to hear what's desired and hope, and then to define what's doable. Yeah. So, as far as uh, the budget goes, right, we've got all kinds of infrastructure issues from you know, keeping water lines, roads, all that. We can't hardly, you know, the budget won't hardly cover just maintenance. Is that a true statement? Like. We're talking about to get to more people coming here. I think you need to distinguish things. things. Do we really have? I think you need to distinguish between wants and needs. So right. the general fund is wants, for lack of a better word. It's also needs because it's streets are in there, and that's the biggest problem around the streets. It really should have some other funding source, and it doesn't. The utilities are in better shape, so they function like a business. And I can get all that information right. for you guys if you want. Pay for those. Yeah. You're paying rates. We're raising the rates. We've got infrastructure needed at the wastewater plant. That's why sewer rates are going up. But those are tied together. Uh, there is money there. There is budgeting. I think the capital improvement schedule, Mike Crandall and some of the other people who have worked on that over the last 10 years have done a great job getting us better to where we are. So now at least there's a plan that every two years we're going to do a new well. We're going to try to do so many water lines. And I can get all those metrics for you guys. Money's still a challenge, I'm not going to say it isn't, but uh, with the plan being done, once the wastewater was taken care of somewhat, we're in better shape. It's just continuing to tackle. We need to keep doing water lines, obviously, but we've got Brad Meek and all that. We've taken care of a lot of big problem areas. Now it's, it's going to be smaller segments. Um, so there needs, in fact, they were just, I might have just talking to Rod this morning about how much to put in on the next plan for that replacement. So the utilities are not. Add that. I guess it's for lack of a better word. Yeah. 
we're, what I'm focused on is general fund. And it's parks, streets, sidewalks, all that stuff's coming out of one pool, and that is basically all property taxes. There's some sales tax in there, but it's not. It's barely making a dent. And I'm trying to figure out how do we get some funding sources that are realistic to match this. So with streets, we know we got to get more dollars. How do we do it? We're, we're working on it. Um, we're hitting grants everywhere we can. We'll, we'll get some good news on Monday with cost share. Um, with sidewalks, that one really needs to come down to we need to budget a certain amount and just do it every year and start tackling the problem. It just hasn't been tackled. ADA is the exact same way. I have brought up ADA several times um, with the CIP committee, and every time they're like, why are you even bringing this? This isn't capital. You should just be doing it every year. We're going to get sued one of these days. We keep putting new stuff in parks and not pouring correct ramps and accesses to it. One of these days it's going to happen. We've got to start. So one of the biggest things you're going to see when I bring you the parks recommendations is going to have ADA on every single park. That's why we went and looked at these parks. Um, it may be that all we get done is the ADA and nothing else, but we got to do it. It's long overdue. Um, it's actually illegal for a city to do a new construction and touch anything in place and not fix the ADA. Uh, what, if it's in place and it's non-compliant, that's fine. It's under the existing status. As soon as you touch it and spend money, and we have done that multiple times. The most recent example is on Kansas Avenue where they report the sidewalk on the north side, third, fourth streets. Um, they support it. They didn't put a ramp in. That's a federal violation. <laughs> so I'm trying to fix it so that that stuff's built into the budget the same way of what they've been doing on the utilities. So at least in the future, that doesn't keep happening. That's step one. Step two, then, is do we, you know, the, the funner stuff that people right. want to see, but how do we right. sustainably do it? And it's going to be tough. Yeah. And we have a problem in Fall River. And we pay $68 for water only, whether or not we use one gallon or not there. Hmm. Here, my utilities are just 70 something with storm, everything. Right. So I don't consider that high. My taxes are higher in that county than they are here. Hmm. So I don't I don't complain. I do say the electric bill is higher, but we're, we're electric. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is going to go up. We know that the sewer rates have actually already been raised, and we know that there's a I mean, of course, there's 2% increases. So the other thing they've done is they've created a slight inflationary increase every year. Into the, the biggest problem, they didn't raise rates back when they should have to build this and to find to where I can do the wastewater plant. So we're kind of making up some loss for them there. But at the same time, they also weren't, you know, fixing the lines. So that is a problem. There is money in the infrastructure bill for uh, water infrastructure. I think it's going to be largely targeted to getting lead pipes out of commission. So you're really talking about service lines from the meter to the house. I didn't, none of us know it's going to look like. I mean, it just passed it Friday. So if it's anything like ARPA, it'll be a year or more before we find out what we're actually getting or what we're eligible for. Um, we did get ARPA money. I think it's up to $1.7 million now. That's going to go to offset some of the cost of the wastewater plant as well. So we'll keep looking for grants and every opportunity we can to reduce those burdens, but it's frustrating sometimes. <laughs> yeah. But I can do that plan, I agree. I think we have definitely had a messaging problem. If one, maybe I didn't realize it was happening until around a year from people, why is this being done? Why is this? And so those people get angry at me at the last meeting, right? So I very carefully when we put out the survey, it's going to never be a promise and it's got to come with some attachment of there's an opportunity cost. If you want this, you got to buy this. Where are you going to get it? <laughs> and so for me, I'm going to tie that back to the funding source. If given this much general fund, we know we hack off that wedge because that's just the cost of doing business and paying salaries. This is what we have left to do. What's your biggest priority out of that if, if it's even there? Thank you for that input. Couldn't help. <laughs> Took my entire getting yelled at. Well, my uh, professional development person, Donna, who gave me a little book with sayings in it that she thought were nuggets and gems and weren't worries like me, but they were mm -hmm. meaningful. One of the things that she said is never wish for more than you're willing. Work for. Oh, there's a price tag with everything. 
money was no object, but unfortunately money is a significant object. So so yeah, I think our process and our, our goal here, and even here that we want to make sure we don't slide too far. What was our timeline for moving through the uh, comprehensive plan? Uh, we do understand the hindrances that uh, that the pandemic has created but and the delays it's caused, but then we want to be kind of you know still aggressive and leaning in and saying, okay, all right, we have to slide back. We don't want to slide back forever. We just want to we, you know we want, we want to just reset the target and say we're gonna hit that, which means you know, appreciate you guys in that we have these uh, more than one hour meetings. Uh, and, uh, and no one's bought yet. So uh, uh, we're doing some good work. Staff is doing good work trying to get through uh, these things and trying to hit the targets that we set for uh, moving through the whole comprehensive plan review. This one will come out with metrics. That's, that's, that was one of our objectives. This will come out with measurements. You know? and, and, and at least if we don't hit the target, we'll know which target we didn't hit as opposed to getting two decades down the road and saying they promised us this and it just went away just stopped becoming a part of the conversation i think that's a good plan i, I applaud i applaud andy for his uh for his pressing that that he wanted measurable things so we're, we're doing that and we're going to stick with that we're going to get the, the final chapter of this comprehensive plan should create a product that's laden with measurables. Zero, five, five, ten, twenties. That so is that a chart something you'd like to see in every chapter, basically? Or, you know, currently we have goals and actions, but we don't have, you want to see it that way? Or we, were, see? we were we were hoping, at least for some things, I think when we, again, when we talked about water, uh, we talked about some timelines we knew we couldn't do every water line in the city, every water transmission line in the city. But what could we do, you know, and if we lay that out, and so that's what's portable and what with staffing is doable, you know, and I think that that's, that's kind of where we were. Okay, so we're trying to get the budget book done and it may not be ready for the December meeting, but we'll definitely have it by January. I think one of the things I can do is get with Jennifer as we're working on that budget at a glance and maybe come up with like a quick digest of the different funds, what the realistic projections are, and maybe give us a better sense of that. But like I said, I think they're already working on the replacement schedule for a lot of that capital. So if it's done, I'll bring it and share it. That'd be good. Yeah, we don't want people to stop dreaming. We don't want people to stop wanting. We just want to be, you know, to add a measure, you know, of, of realism to what, what it costs versus what the resources that we have, you know. So there's great things that are going on. People are always doing stuff, and uh, uh, we just have to say we we operate. We have what well, the city does. It's cash basis law. We operate within our means. I think that's that's that was the goal with this is is to say uh, we know this isn't all doable. You know it isn't all doable now or in two years or or even five years, but this is prioritized you know, what's the most important thing i think that's why we stuck started with the, with the you know nuts and bolts stuff with, with everything so anyway but anyway, that's it that's not it. <laughs> are you are you done yeah i just wanted to share i mean i don't know if i give you guys an update on the paris park pool committee yet recently but it's really ballooning quickly into a much bigger thing than just the pool the good side of that is uh, this is the best collaboration i've ever seen among the taxing entities and i think there's a common shared commitment all the way up to the highest levels of governance for the college and school districts and us the recognition um, to work together do whatever we can to minimize the burden on taxpayers and make sure we take care of all the needs as we identify them and cut the duplication so kind of like what we talk about the hospitals we know we got to get more creative and more collaborative because they're just the resources to be duplicating everything jeff talked about daycare that has actually come up in those meetings 
Um, the school has a strong interest. Well, we don't need six or seven different daycare centers popping up competing for grant funds. We need to all work together on a cooperative system that may be at multiple facilities, but there needs to be. So those things are all being looked at. Our next meeting, which hasn't been set yet, we were going to meet with Valley Center because they're about 18 to 24 months further in the process than we are on this. And they've been working with um, our pool consultant and our Wilson Park consultant to try to get an idea of a roadmap, like, okay, so you're here, we're here, how do we get to there, where are the markers, when do you go to the public and start getting input, when do you, you know, because um, I think all four entities are kind of like, well, we're not ready to go public with big ideas yet, we want to make sure we're on the same page, but when, when should we be getting to that point and making sure we're making progress? I don't know how long it's going to take, it's not going to be next year, I'm telling you that. I think April is kind of what we threw out as a, we can start to get a little more concrete with this, and that includes things like looking at financing and other stuff. Um, but we've all got new elected officials. We're going to have to get up to speed. Um, the library's been pulled into discussions now, so I don't I don't know what's going to come up. Other than I'll tell you, we're definitely looking at not only the Carver Park area, but make sure we keep Wilson Park and the empty hospital lot. If they try to do everything they're talking about, it is all going to stay down the Carver Park. It's just not a plan. So. We've got two large parcels that are undeveloped that we could do something with. Let's make sure it's the right something that we can afford it that all the partners can benefit from it. That's that's really as far as we've got. So we need to get the conference plan done because that's our piece of the equation of these are the city's priorities. The college is doing a facilities plan right now, the district is doing a facilities plan right now, the Rex Center is doing a facilities plan, and we're all gonna then come together and make sure that we can work together on something. So maybe five years, maybe 10 years, I don't know, but it seems like they're moving forward faster than we anticipated. Uh, so we'll just see where that goes. I think there needs to be a goal a plan to continue these collaborations and keep this going yeah. forward because that's reality now. And Jack Bear preserves it. Yeah, that'd be real nice. Hey, uh, guys, we See if anybody got any rocks in their pockets. We still got 45 minutes. <laughs> I will not take 45 minutes. You have 55 minutes, then I run over. <laughs> We're talking about 55 minutes. <laughs> I would like about five minutes, actually, to uh, talk about land use, because that was the topic we originally were going to move to. <laughs> I wanted to at least pass this out to one of it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that a copy? Yes, please. I don't have very many planning commissioners here tonight. So I think I think I may be scared because I'm a kid. <laughs> <laughs> I was great that she stays on So, real quick, chapter eight, and it may not be chapter eight, we don't know, um, but land use and growth management is kind of a last chapter, and it's the last chapter and the last one on purpose because you have to look at virtually every other topic in order to do proper land use. Um, obviously, the goals are a little bit different. Um, Land use doesn't always require money per se, but the interesting thing about land use is it can affect money. And, and the reason I say that is because um, how we develop affects how much tax, how much of a tax base we have. Um, so you got to be able to develop the right thing in the right place at the right time. And it's a constant battle. Uh, and you can tell that if you just quickly flip through this, you can see the different recommendations that have been put in in past plans. Uh, some of them lacked the metric that we've been talking about, and so they're still sitting there. The thing about land use goals and actions, though, sometimes it's not so much about a metric as so much as uh, guideline to get you to the right place and that's why some of these 
goals keep coming back from old plans uh, because either they weren't fully realized or there's still an issue that's not going really away and it may never go away. Um, things like uh, where our floodplains are, we can't affect, we can't have any effect on where floodplains really are. Um, so it's something that we still have to look at every time we do one of these. Um, the other thing about land use is the zoning regulations and the subdivision regulations. What we did back in 2013 when we redrafted this plan was we also, and several of you were on the commission at that time, we had to totally redo our zoning regulations and subdivision regulations because they had not been wholesale redone since 1964. So at that time, it was about 50 years. They had tons of amendments. They had some little reworks, um, but they weren't totally redone. But they were redone in 2014. And we've done a few amendments since then um, to fix little things because um, it just works the way we want it. And after this plan is adopted, one of the things among the hundreds of other things that we're talking about in this plan is to go to the zoning regulations and the subdivision regulations and see what has worked in the last seven, well, it'll be eight years by the time that happens. See what's worked, see what hasn't worked. And I already have a laundry list of things that I will be introducing uh, when we get to those amendments. Uh, just little things that have come up over the years that, uh, again, didn't work the way we thought they would. Um, we also have some new things like what just came up tonight at the Board of Zoning Appeals meeting. Um, there's some really creative things out there um, that other cities across the country and even across the world um, do to deal with these strange things that come up, um, like really small lots and old subdivisions. How do you deal with them? Uh, is it okay to do what we did tonight by making a smaller lot? Um, or is that really, really a negative thing? Right now we're doing it on a case by case basis with stuff like what the gentleman requested, um, but there's other ways to fix uh, those sorts of things so they don't happen as often. Now, of course, you can't fix necessarily what happened 100 years ago, which is part of the argument we had tonight too, um, but you can prevent that happening again in the future. So one of the things, uh, Oh, okay. oh, it's not here. One of the things that we look at when we do a comprehensive plan and we specifically look at the land use is the future land use map. And I put a copy of that in the back of the plan. And obviously, I do not want to go through that tonight um, for time sake, but we will have to go through this map. Um, at some point in the future, maybe maybe next month, we'll, we'll see what happens. That's depending on what other topics happen that are surface at the time. But what I'm doing right now with the future land use map is looking at what has changed and what hasn't changed. Um, and there's actually two maps in your packet, one that's for the city only and one that's for our growth area. So that'll be something I'll talk to talk about too, is what what a growth area is and what a and what we want. But I already noticed a few places around the city and other growth area that are clearly not doing what we uh, looked at. Part of the problem with the growth area is it was developed off of the 2007 corridor plan, which is quite frankly dated. Some of the stuff that happened that they thought might happen just didn't. Happen, probably won't happen. So I'm going to scale back some of the expectations and development along the corridor uh, because, quite frankly, we don't want to just what's the way I want to say this? We don't want to develop sprawl for the sake of development sprawl. We want to have this a little more organized. So 
we we know that probably at some point we're going to continue to develop closer to Strutterville, and probably Winfield is going to develop closer to Strutterville on our side. Um, so that's not a closed book, but it's it's not something that we can really plan for in the short term. But I maybe that is a is a metric type of goal for what we want the, that corridor to look like in the future. But, Anyway, the, the point being of the whole discussion is that we are going to have to make some adjustments to what we did in 2014 and then 13 because things have changed just like they do every year. And that's why we have to redo this comprehensive plan every five to seven years or so because things change in the community. We could have never foreseen uh, COVID, for example, in 2014. And strangely, how that even affects land use. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing nationally is, uh, like in your downtown areas, retail is starting to go away. And instead, you're starting to see stuff like uh, fulfillment centers, like Amazon does. And we have to make a decision whether or not it is okay to have a warehouse in a commercial district. So that's one of the things that we'll have to look at. How, how do we deal with that? How do we deal with, um, we don't have this so much here, but in some of the bigger cities, how do you deal with telecommuters that don't go to an office anymore? Do we still need office space available for, for those people? Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Maybe the office space could be used for something else. So all this stuff is something that you have to think about when we're talking about the growth of the city. And not even necessarily about growth. Just uh, sometimes it's just about what we have today and what our community wants to see in the future. So we have to look at this topic just like we look at infrastructure, how we look at the water sewer, how we look at the streets, how we look at the parks. Uh, all those things matter. And it, even Andrew was talking about different plans to bring all these different pinks into one spot, we got enough space for it. So with that being said, I don't want to keep you here any longer. <laughs> um, but I did want to talk about this. this as far as the topics and the comprehensive plan go, this is my favorite. Um, so that's because of the uh, exciting stuff. I could bring along for the tar for hours <laughs> on this topic, but I But I did I did want to since I planned to do this as our main topic tonight, I wanted to spend a few minutes. So I didn't know if that was five minutes, it was close to five minutes. <laughs> didn't seem like 50? No. Oh, that's good. Questions or, or comments on the move that we have to adjourn. Second it. Okay, so we have a motion and a second to adjourn. Uh, uh, I have the language. Thank you, Josh, for your presentation. Anyway, all in favor. Aye. Aye. Aye.